Was that awesome or what? We've been to thank, we've, we've been to church this morning already, haven't we? This has been amazing. And uh, also, we've got a campus in Pendleton where God is at work there. Can we give it up for Pendleton? I've heard in the last couple of weeks in Pendleton, they have just been, uh, I don't know what's going on there. Something in the water, they're growing like crazy in the summer. I can't wait to see what happens in the fall. P-Town, we're so proud of you, what you guys are doing. We love you. Hey, there are two types of people in this world, and I think we all fit in one of these categories. One of the categories are the people who are the do-it-yourselfers, the DIYers. There's no project too big, no project too intimidating. There's nothing they won't attempt. I mean, they're just, okay, if there's something that needs to be done, I can figure it out. I will do this thing. There's the do-it-yourselfers. And then there are the other type of people who are the ones that are to go, you know what? I've got a problem. I need to call in the professionals. I'm not going to deal with this. I've tried it before. Every time I do it, I make more of a mess than what I began with. It costs me more money every time I get involved in it. I'm just going to farm this out. I'm going to hire a professional to do the job. So by a show of hands, okay, I know we all fit in one of those categories. How many of you would call yourself DIY till you die. I'm going to do it. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. Lots of DIYers. How many of you fall into the other categories like, no, I'm not even going to attempt it. Let's just pay somebody to do that. A lot of those. And I think I used to be in that category a lot more. But since this incredible blessing from God called YouTube, I can figure out how to do almost everything now. It's amazing. Over the last few years, what I have attempted to do I don't know that I've done it well, but I have fixed my freezer, my stove, I've worked on cars, I have uh, done some electrical and plumbing, and um, you know, it's, it's amazing, but uh, there are certain times when it's not wise to do it yourself. There are times it's better to get a professional, you know what I'm saying, because sometimes it doesn't work out so well. So I want to give you, in, in, in kind of in light of that, I want to give you some DIY fails from the internet of some people who thought they could do it, maybe didn't do such a good job. And so if you're considering any of these things, you might want to reconsider, all right? So the first one is uh, the DIY shower head. Uh, let's see if we can get those up there. I don't know if you can see that. Now, that's a fail, but it, maybe it's not because it, it's working. It's a beer can with some holes drilled in it, but it seems to be working. I don't know. Okay, that's probably not a good example. How about, how about the ones like you've got the big birthday party coming around the corner and you want to bake a cake? Probably not a good idea if you're not a baker. All right, so here's, <laughs> let me kind of see. All right, okay, so you can see this is the SpongeBob cake. I can picture this. You've got one of your kids going to have a birthday party. They just got to have the SpongeBob cake. All the friends and, and, and all their classmates are coming over. And you're too cheap to buy the cake. So you, I can do this DIY YouTube and, you, and this is yours. And don't you love the caption? Nailed it. I got this one. How about haircuts? Don't do a DIY haircut or else you might look like this poor kid. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be good. And if you're a big game hunter and you shoot your trophy, don't try to cheap out and do the own, your own taxidermy or you might get something like this. You know, just last, a couple weeks ago, 4th of July, and I know this is the South, so everybody loves fireworks, but sometimes it's best to leave that to professionals because otherwise you might have this DIY fail when it came to fireworks. I don't think your neighbors were too happy about that. <laughs> Can we all agree that sometimes it's best not to do it yourself? It's better to call in the professionals. Now, there are times where it's not a good idea to call in the professionals. When it comes to church and when it comes to ministry, it's more of a DIY. It's not meant to be left to the paid professionals to do that. I think we have this idea in our mind, unfortunately, 
when it comes to church, when it comes to ministry, that we look at the people on staff that are getting paid to do it, and we consider them the paid professionals, and, and, and everybody else, you know, kind of just defers to them, and let's just have them do it. So maybe you're the type of person that you've got somebody, you know, that, that, that person at work that you just, you just need to tell them about Jesus, but you don't want to do it, and so you say, man, I just need to, I just need to call a pastor. Or something like that. See, see the, the problem with that mentality is that it's wrong, it's not biblical, and we're going to look at that today. And we're in a series called Spinoffs. And in this series, we're looking at different biblical characters that don't get, they don't get a lot of, um, they're not in the limelight. They're, they're just kind of, they're sidekicks. They're just people who nobody really knows. They're just the more anonymous type people that are mentioned in the Bible here and there. And we're looking at a guy today that's only mentioned two times in the Bible. Uh, his name is Archippus, and Archippus is a guy who we lo- know very little about. Again, just two brief m- references to him, and yet he plays a big role. Because what we here's what we know about him. All right, let me just kind of give you a, a brief background on that. Um, what we know is only what was mentioned in the book of Philemon, and in the book of Philemon, a very short book in the New Testament. But Philemon and his wife had a church that met in their home. It was the church of Colossa met in their home, and they had a son named Archippus. So Archippus, we know, is Philemon's son. And we also know that the church in Colossa met in their home. Where we get the book of Colossians is where it's mentioned the second time, where he's mentioned the second time, which we're going to look at today. Now, let me just kind of set this up for those who don't know. Now, the book of Colossians was originally a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote from prison to the church in Colossa that was meeting in Philemon's home. And in that, he gives all kind of, if you read the book of Colossians, what you'll see is that it is a treasure of theology. If you want just some good theology about the gospel, about who Jesus is and who you are in Christ, if, if you want to know that... Colossians is a great place to go. So he writes this letter to the church in Colossa, and it's intended to not only go to them, but to the church in Laodicea, which you're going to see in a second. And he goes through the, for the, for the letter, or what we have now as a book, and he comes to the end of that, and there we find the second reference to Archippus. And in this final part of the letter that Paul writes, he is writing some kind of some challenges to different people. He, he, he drops some names. Many of those are, are people that would fit right into our series that we don't even really know much about. They're just mentioned. And he challenges them and he, and he encourages people. And as he's working through that list of people he wants to make sure that he sh- gives a shout out to, he comes to Archippus. And we're going to look at that in Colossians chapter 4. Um, and I'm only going to read the last part of that because there's other parts of his shout outs that I'm not going to read but in Colossians chapter 4 we're going to pick up in verse 14 and and it's just a brief challenge to Archippus that I think is the same challenge that God wants to give us and so here it is he says Luke the beloved doctor sends his greetings so does Demas now we know Luke because he is one of the big names Uh, he wrote the gospel of Luke he is also wrote the book of Acts and so he mentions Luke Luke the beloved doctor sends his greetings so does Demas Please give my greetings to our brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that meets in her house. After you've read this letter, pass it on to the church of Laodicea so they can read it too. And you should read the letter I wrote to them. And say to Archippus, okay, so there's the mention. And say to Archippus, be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. Here's my greeting in my own handwriting. Paul, remember my chains. May God's grace be with you. So Paul, in prison because he's preached the gospel and is arrested, he's, he's sending out these encouragements and challenges to the people that he loves, the people that he knows, the people he's had encounters with. And he brings up this idea. We don't know a lot about Archippus, but we, we could, I think it's safe to say that he was not a paid professional. This was a guy who just, you know, the church met in his parents' home. He's probably a young man, but we don't know a lot about him. But what we do know is the challenge that Paul gave him And I think that we can dispel this myth that ministry is left to the paid professionals. Because again, I know there are a lot of us, when it comes to the situation we have in life, our first, and unfortunately, our our default is that we go call the church. So that friend who needs Jesus, again, rather than sharing Jesus with them, I better call the church. 
Hey, I need a paid professional. Pastor, can you cover a witness to my friend because they need Jesus? Or there's a need in the community. And you see that need. But your response, rather than to meet that need yourself, is to say, I need to call a paid professional. I need to call a pastor to do this. I need a minister to do this ministry. And so we reach out to the church and say, you know what? God's laid this burden on my heart, and there's this need in our community. Can we get a pastor over here to do that? Or, or we, we have somebody in the hospital that's a friend of ours, and we say, I better call the church to make sure a pastor comes over and sees my friend in a hospital. Now, again, nothing wrong with any of those things other than the fact is that some of that responsibility should be ours rather than the paid professionals. So today, as we look at this, and, and I want to challenge you because if you are a Christian, let me just say this. If you call yourself a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus, if you've given your life to Jesus, let me tell you something. Here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you are a minister. You are a minister. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a minister. You're a minister. Now say to yourself, I'm a minister. Now, well, you didn't say that with any resolve because you don't believe that. Right? You don't believe that. But you are, according to the Bible, you are a minister. And here's the thing. There is an oxymoron. If you're a minister... You need a ministry, and a minister without a ministry is not a minister at all. So it's kind of an oxymoron, right? Those are two words that don't fit together. So what you have to do is you got to say, okay, what is the ministry God gave me? Because the challenge that, that, that Paul gave Archippus is to make sure that you fulfill the ministry the, the, the ministry the Lord gave you. So today we're going to dig down on that because I want to really drive this home that you are capable of a lot more than you think you are. When it comes to serving God. And when we see ourselves differently, it changes everything. So I just got two simple points today. And the first point is this. Ministry is the role of all Christians. Everybody say all. All Christians. Not some, not most, not 99.9%, but all Christians. Ministry is the role of all Christians, not just the paid professionals. Not just the paid professionals. Ministry is a second career for me. Just Many of you know that. I I was in business. Um... I had a long run doing that as an entrepreneur in a business, and uh, then God called me into ministry. So this is kind of a second career. And prior to that, okay, when I was in business, um, I, I always just felt like I was in ministry. And I wasn't getting paid to do it, but I was, felt like that was my ministry. And people would say, you know, have you ever thought about going to ministry? I said, I am in ministry. This is my ministry. This is the ministry God's given me. And, and, and th- my pulpit is my business, but uh, it's, it's just different than what I do now. Because now, I'm, I guess I'm a paid professional, whereas I was a minister all the time. And what I, what I mean by that is just simply this, is that what I saw my business, what I did, whatever it was I did as a ministry, an opportunity to do ministry. So what is ministry? Ministry is just doing things in Jesus' name that has a gospel bent to it. So somehow, you're weaving through the gospel into the story of your life as you interact with people. And that's why we're all ministers. And so there are things that we can do service-wise in the name of Jesus that, that can impact people that a paid staff can't because of your network of people that you um, are in, that, that influence that you have personally. And that's why God puts you in those arenas. And when we see it that way, everything changes. And one thing about most churches that I've noticed is that they are not functioning biblically when it comes to this. Um, in most churches, we've all heard these some of these statistics. I don't know how accurate they are, but you, you've all probably heard the statistics that that. 90% of the ministry is, is being done by 10% of the people. Now, all of these things at Foothills don't apply because we're an anomaly. About 70% of our people serve somewhere. But in most churches, the, the functioning of the church is, is incorrect. There's a mentality of, in most churches that, that the pastors are the paid professionals. And therefore, if there's a need, let me just call a pastor. And so what happens is it creates a consumer mentality for the people that go there. They become the audience and the pastor becomes a performer. And, and what happens in those situations is that the expectation of the pastor is unrealistic. And that's why the churches can't grow beyond the pastor's ability to do what they're, he's expected to do by the congregation, who is now the audience, rather than fellow servants with him. And so you see this often in, in churches where the, there's this expectation for the pastor to deliver the goods every time he's you know, around, like he's perfect. And so the idea is, hey, pastor, man, you better bring us a 10 sermon on Sunday 
Sunday morning is coming, and we expect the 10 because, man, we just, we need that. We want to be fed by you. And then we got Sunday night, and then, Pastor, you better bring a 10 on Sunday night, too, because, you know what, you better feed your sheep. And don't forget Wednesday night because we got another service on Wednesday night, and we don't expect any less than a 10 there either. And then we expect you to be at every hospital visit and then just visit the members in general all the time. We expect you also to be cleaning the church building because we want the house of God to look presentable and mow the lawn because you can't leave that unkempt. And if I got an eat in the middle of the night, man, I'm, I better call the pastor because he needs to be on call 24-7. So 2 o'clock in the morning, the pastor who's trying to get some rest gets a call from a, from a church member. He says, Pastor, I need you to come over. It's an emergency. Oh, oh my goodness, what's wrong? What, what, what do I need to do? I just need prayer. Okay, what, what, what do we need to pray about? I think my cat has hemorrhoids. Can you come over and pray for my... I mean, ridiculous things like this. Like, okay, is that even realistic? No, that's not the way it was biblically functioned. Um, it reminded me of the story I heard about the perfect pastor. I want to read this. This is the, per- the resume of the perfect pastor. It says, after hundreds of years, the perfect pastor has been found. He is the pastor who pleases everyone. He preaches exactly 20 minutes, so you're never late for lunch. He condemns sin but never steps on anybody's toes. He works from 8 in the morning to 11 at night doing everything from preaching sermons to sweeping. He makes $400 a week, and he gives $200 of that back to the church. He drives a late model car, buys lots of books, wears fine clothes, and has a nice family. He always stands ready to contribute to every good cause and to help panhandlers who drop by the church on the way to somewhere. He's 36 years old and has been preaching for 40 years. He's, he's, he's tall on the short side, heavy set in a thin sort of way, and handsome. He has eyes of blue or brown to fit the occasion and wears his hair parted in the middle, left side, dark and straight, right side, brown and wavy. He has a burning desire to work with the youth and spends all his time with the senior citizens. He smiles all the time while keeping a straight face because he has a keen sense of humor that finds him seriously dedicated. He makes 15 calls a day on church members and spends all his time evangelizing non-members and is always found in his study if he is needed. Unfortunately, he burned himself out and died at the age of 32. So that's the end of that guy, right? The problem with that scenario is that's the way it's working in a lot of churches. Again, it doesn't apply to us directly, but I'm making a point here is that that is not the biblical model. Now, you might go, well, why do we pay the pastors the big, big bucks if it's not to do everything? I'm glad you asked. Let me just show you what the Bible says about this, okay? So the Bible is clear about the role and responsibility of, of, of the paid professionals and the role of everyone. So here, here's what it says. And he himself, speaking of God, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now watch, here's their role. Here's what they do. Here's why they're, they're paid. Here's what, the, here's what their responsibility is. To equip the saints... That's everybody who's given their life to Jesus. God calls them saints. To equip the saints to do the work of ministry, to build the body of Christ. Build up the body of Christ. Did you catch that? So so the pastor's job is to equip the people to do the work of the ministry. So you might put it this way. The pastors are the administers and the people are the ministers. And so every one of us is a minister. That's what the Bible teaches. The role of the pastor is to help equip you to do your ministry that God's called you to do. You have a ministry to do. It's not just for the paid professionals. It's, it, it's, it's incredible. And so when we see anything other than that, it is not biblical. Let's look at what it says in uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Listen to this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. God has this work for you, this plan for you, this calling in your life, something he wants you to do. And when you look at even Jesus, he didn't surround himself with paid professionals. The disciples had no training, no education, no seminary. They weren't paid to do what they did. They just went and they were serving God. They did ministry. It isn't about, think about this, paid professionals built the Titanic. It was an amateur who built the ark, right? God uses regular people to to do just supernatural things. And this this is the calling God's given. It's a great calling. And it's something we ought to just like step into rather than go, oh man, I need to call the pastor to do this. I mean, you, you, you're short selling yourself because God wants to use you in great capacity to do things that you can't, it will blow your mind if you even knew what he could use you to do. 
It's just continue to say yes to God. And so when we look at this, we got to go, okay, if, I, if that's the case, then what's the next step? Well, here's, what's, here's, what, here's the, the challenge. And it's the second point. It says, be, and it's the same thing that the, the, apostle, uh, that the apostle Paul told Archippus. Be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. Be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. Now, we don't know what Archippus' ministry was. Because that's what it says. Paul said, and say to Archippus, be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. What is his ministry? I don't know. We don't know. We don't know what his ministry is. Apparently he knew, and Paul knew, but we don't know, and it doesn't really matter. It's almost like that's almost irrelevant to what Paul's trying to say. It's just saying, hey, that careless ministry the Lord gave you, emphasizing the you. What could Archippus be doing? I don't know. Is the church men in their home? Maybe he was a greeter. Maybe he served donuts. I don't, I don't have, probably they did. I don't know. Maybe Archippus was on the parking lot team. He was helping direct camel traffic. I don't know what he was doing. Maybe Archippus was a small group leader. Maybe he served in the kids' ministry at Colossa Community Church. I don't know. Maybe he worked, served in the youth ministry. Maybe he... I don't know, maybe he did technology, administrative things. Maybe he ran a sound and the light. I don't know. I doubt it, right? But you see my point? He had a ministry. We don't know what it is. doesn't matter what it is. Paul said, hey, just be sure. Just be faithful with what God's given you. The ministry God gave you, fulfill it. Carry it out. This is what your responsibility is. Hey, Archippus, be sure to do this. I think that's what God would say to all of us. Be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. And so the natural question is, wait a second, what, what ministry did the Lord give me? How do I know that? How do I figure this out? Isn't that what we just said a second ago? That's what the pastors are here for? To equip you to do the work of the ministry? So if you don't know what it is, then the responsibility of the people here on staff is to help you figure it out, to to help you discover what it is, to help you develop whatever that gift is, to help you deploy that gift in, in a meaningful work of ministry somewhere. That's what it's about. And that's, that's so much fun when you figure that out. And so that's, that's what the staff is here to do. So you might ask a couple questions like this. What am I good at? I mean, you're trying to figure out your ministry. What is it that God wants me to do? What is it that I could possibly do to serve God in, in my ministry? Like my personal unique ministry. What is it? Well, what are you good at? And by the way, I got a little caveat to that. Um, s- s- with what you're good at, make sure that someone other than your mother told you you were good at it. Okay? Like my mother told me I could sing like an angel. I need to be on a worship team. Uh, no, we've heard you sing. You do not sing like an angel. You do not. Do not. That, that's not for you. So it has to be some, you, when you're hearing multiple people going, hey, you do that pretty well. Like, oh, Okay. Maybe that's, maybe that's it. So what do, you do? what do you do well? What am I good at? What are your spiritual gifts? I'm going to come to that in just a second because you might go, I don't even know what that is. That's a supernatural endowment God gives you on, on the day you, you are saved. He gives you something you can do well to serve God and, and others. So your spiritual gifts. What am I passionate about? What do I enjoy doing? What brings me joy? What fulfills me? Where am I needed? What are my past life experiences that maybe God can use in some sort of ministry to others? And by the way, ministry is, is not just in the realm of church. You should have a ministry within the local body, of course, because the church is a body, which we'll talk more about in just a second. You need a ministry within the church, but outside the walls of the church, it's not like you come and punch in the clock, do your ministry, and go. You're always a minister, right? Every, everything you do is an opportunity to ministry. The people you work by, you're, you're the minister in that place. Someone's got an issue, you ought to be the safe place they can come and get prayer. Someone with some wisdom, godly wisdom, that you can share with them, something from the scripture where you can make a difference in their life. You're a minister in that workplace. You're a minister in your home. Parents, you're a minister in your home. In those places, you have your recreation, your hobbies. You're the minister. You ought to be the place where people look to and go, man, if I've got a problem, I'm just having a struggle with my, in my relationship with my spouse, maybe that, I think that person can help me. 
Some of the greatest ministries outside the walls of the church. Maybe it's an aging parent. Someone sick that you can help. Maybe it's that neighbor that needs you to step in and do something for them because they're unable to do it. Ministry in the name of Jesus. See, that's what separates us from just doing nice things. Is if we're doing ministry, there's a focus. It's always leading back to the gospel in some way. You're letting your light shine so that your God, your Father could be praised. I mean, the greatest ministry I've ever seen in my life was when my, my mother, uh, several months ago, was in those last stages of her life. I've seen my brother and some of my wife ministry like I've never seen. Ministry. Caring. Loving. Support, prayer. That's ministry. And we all are ministers. You have a capacity to make a difference in someone's life, and God has blessed you with that. Why would you want to, why would you want to farm that out to the paid professional when you have the opportunity to do it? Like that is the honor in life where God is using your life. Figure out what it is. We'll help you. Romans chapter 12. Verses 6 through 8 and verse 11. In his grace. That's that's important. that That phrase there. In his grace. When we think about God's grace. I think we always of course consider our salvation. It is by grace we're saved. And that's true. God's grace. Unmerited favor. But this is used in a different reference. Look at what what is said here. In his grace, his unmerited favor, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Those are your spiritual gifts. You didn't earn those. God, in his grace, gave those to you to be used faithfully. God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you The ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Never be lazy, but work hard. And serve the Lord enthusiastically. That is not an exhaustive list of spiritual gifts. That's just, a, that's just a few. But the point he's trying to make is he's saying, look, God is in his grace. God gave you these things to use. He knew you and he uniquely blessed you. You have something to offer. And God put it in you. So use it well. He said, don't be lazy. Don't farm it out to the other people. Do it well. Do it lazy. Doing as as if unto the Lord. This is how we're to serve. This is how we're to minister. And a minister without a ministry is not a minister at all. You've got to have your ministry. You've got to figure out what that is. Inside the church. Outside the church. Where you're that person who can make a difference in someone's life. In 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul writes to Timothy and says this. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Did you love the way he worded that? To fan into flames the spiritual gift God had given you. So you, by his grace, God gave you a spiritual gift. Something that you can do supernaturally, something you can do well. And again, you might not know what it is. We'll help you figure that out. That's why we're here. It's why the staff does what they do to help you, to equip those saints to do the work of the ministry. And so God said, giving you the gift. And and Paul says to Timothy, fan into flames the gift that God has given you. You ever try to do a campfire? What happens when you fan flames? Do they go out? I got no Boy Scouts in here? Girl Scouts? What happens when you fan a flame? It gets bigger. You would think it'd go out, right? Because you'd like to blow it out. No, it gets bigger. Fan into flames. We, a couple weeks ago, 
well, maybe a month ago or so, we took our grandkids to Smoky Mountains. We rent a little cabin. And um, they had a fire pit. They wanted, they, their grandkids wanted to do s'mores. And so the fire pit was there, and they had this wood. Unfortunately, it was, it was not exposed to the rain because it rains in the mountains like every night, every day it rained in the mountains. But it was, it was damp. And the wood was undercover, but it, it really wasn't dry. So they wanted a campfire so bad, and they wanted to do the s'mores. And we got, I got the wood set up there and tried to light it, put some, you know, some paper and things, tried to get it. And then I realized, oh, they got lighter fluid because it wasn't lighting well. So I got a lighter fluid. Didn't look like the fireworks display I showed a minute ago, but I put flyer, I mean, I put lighter fluid all over it, lit it. It was beautiful. And then the lighter fluid finally died out, and the wood wasn't dry enough to actually do anything. You, you, I don't know. And so we're fanning the flames. And it looks like it's going to go. won't go. And it was like, man, they're not going to have it. So I, I did what any good Boy Scout did. I got two sticks and rubbed them together, and I lit this beautiful fire. Okay, I didn't do that. I went down to the store. They had this Dura log, Dura flame log. And you don't even have to take it out of the wrapper. The whole wrapper lights and it just, it was beautiful. But we still fan the flames. And the point is this, with Paul saying fan in the flames, the spiritual gift God's given you, because what happens if you don't fan the flame? Go out. It'll eventually go out. There are many of you in this room probably today, Pendleton, watching online, at one time, those spiritual gifts that God had given you, you were, I mean, it was a blazing fire. You couldn't wait to serve God. You looked for opportunities to minister to people. You were just, I mean, it was, nobody had to inspire you to do it. It was the Holy Spirit doing it in you. And it was a joy to serve. It wasn't a burden. And you looked forward to Sunday because you got a chance to interact with people and serve God in that way. And you look for opportunities when you got out to your workplace and in other places that you went. But those are days in the past and those embers are kind of, they're, they're dying out. And if you're not careful, right now they're smoldering, but they'll go out. Fan into flames. Spiritual gift God put in you. Fan it into flames again. Because if you don't, it'll go out. I'm in a unique situation in my own life. This is just kind of a little, like, I've been, um, if you think about it, for the last 26 years, fortunately, I've never had my identity of what I did. Okay, so, like, I, I, I was on staff here and all that, but I, that was never my identity. I'm really fortunate. I know a lot of pastors, that becomes their identity. It wasn't for me. However... It's a big part of what I did, right? My responsibilities, what I, how I served was pretty much every week I was up here was preaching and doing this and that. But in April, when Pastor Kevin took leadership and my wife and I stepped back from leadership, it created this like, okay, what do we do now? And by the way, can I say this? Pastor Kevin is killing it, too. I'm going to tell you why. He is a... It's amazing. I am so thankful for him and Katie and the kids. I just, I just, but anyways, so, so when we handed that off, all of a sudden it's like, okay, now what? Like I knew what I was doing before, but now what do I do? And so right now, my wife and I are in that discovery phase with many of you. So we're joining you with that. What is it? That God words? What is it? What does it look like now? And so um, we're not sure. I mean, we don't know. We know that we're, we're, gonna, we're, we, we're not getting paid, you know, as a staff anymore. We're not on staff anymore. But that doesn't mean we can't do ministry, right? So what I'm saying is that whatever God gave you to do, do it well. Figure it out. And if you don't know for sure, that's okay. That's, that's, that's fair. Pray about it. Seek counsel. Ask some of our staff. We'll be happy to do this with you, but it, when you discover it and do it, man, do it well. I've figured out, when I grow up, I want to be like Dan and Suzanne, Suzanne Landreth. 
Now, some of you don't know them. But let me tell you about them. Now, they, they're probably, they're going to, I don't know, I haven't seen them today. So I'm probably sick. They're here. Oh, I, I should have known that. Okay. But anyways, they're going to be mad that I'm even bringing this up. But these people are amazing. They're retired folks, but they're full-time ministries. I mean, they are here. I don't even know how many hours. When I was full-time on staff, they were here more than I was. Okay, I'm just saying that. There is nothing they won't do. If you were to go to, in the dictionary, look up serving, minister, I am confident their pictures would be there. Okay, this is the kind of thing. They are nonstop. They are dedicated to ministry. And they don't get paid to do it. Their rewards will be in heaven. And it's just so inspiring when you see someone like that who is now in their retirement, full-time serving God. Every, our Christmas light show, if you've ever been to that, you can thank Dan Landers for that. I mean, this, this, this guy can do technical. Suzanne with the hospitality and uh, oh, just, oh, they're amazing people. So, and there are so many of you like that. But, but when, when I, that's what I want to be. That's how I want to be. Because that inspires me. Fan in the flames of spiritual gift God has given you. Don't leave it to the professionals. You, God has called you. Be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. At the end of the day, there'll be something on, you know, written on your tombstone. There'll be some epitaph there somewhere. What do you want on there? And, and here's, what I, here's what I think would be awesome. And this, you know, King David in the Old Testament, this is not what's on his tombstone, but it could be, because here's what it says about David. It says, for David served God's purposes in his own time, and then he died. He fulfilled the ministry God called him to, and he was done. He died. I mean, I don't know, I don't know any better way to have it. Like, I have fulfilled everything God's called me to do with my last breath, and now I enter into heaven and hopefully hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. I mean, that is a slam dunk. The last thing that I would ever want to go is, you know, make it to heaven. And, and, and God's like, dude, you missed so many opportunities. Why did you call the staff member? I had you right there. Nobody wants to live like that. Be sure to fulfill the ministry that God has given you. There are so many ways you can serve. I've mentioned a few of those things that kids, areas, teenagers, ministration, help here or there, just all those. There's so many places. Figure it out. Be faithful to use it. I'm going to hand it over to our back to Pendleton campus and Pastor Joseph. Can we say Goodbye to them. We love you guys. And so here, uh, I want to pray. And then Pastor Kevin's going to give you kind of some next steps. All right? So this is going to be real easy. So if you're trying to figure out, oh, what do I do next? He's going to give you some next steps. So let's pray together. Pastor Kevin will close this. Father, thank you again for all that you're doing in this place. Thank you that we have a church that really gets it. This is, I'm preaching to the choir today, that our people are servants. They're ministers. And... Uh, I just pray for those that maybe if um, maybe the, 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 f the flames are going out a little bit. They just need a little fanning. And I'm praying that that happened today through your Holy Spirit. I pray, God, for those who have never, they've never just stepped up because they didn't know what to do or it seemed too intimidating or maybe they didn't feel like they were needed. But I pray that today, God, that they would just take a step. Mostly, God, I pray for those who don't know Jesus. Um, they're here. They're carrying the weight of their sin They've never discovered that grace that you offer them, their salvation, their forgiveness. But their lives could be radically changed with a commitment of their heart. And if that's you today, and you just need freedom, and you need salvation, and you need forgiveness, Jesus is your answer. And if you'd like to invite him to be the leader of your life, maybe you offer a prayer like this in your own words. Lord Jesus, today I lay down my life before you, and I ask you to save me. Forgive me of my sins. I've made a mess of things, but I want you to make things right. And so I'm inviting you to take control of my life from this day forward. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness in all of it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Put us, can we show our gratitude for the word? It was so good. It was so good.
Hey, and before you leave today, if you need somebody to pray with, we've got a team up here of some ministers, some volunteers, and some staff that would love to minister to you uh, through prayer. If you received Jesus today, they have a free resource, a free Bible, and some next steps uh, for you as well. And then if you're interested in finding out, hey, I do want to serve. I do want to get plugged in, just kind of like a Dan and Suzanne Landers, but I'm not sure how. We wanted to make that as easy as possible for you today. So there's actually a QR code uh, popping up on the screen right now. If you take out your phone and you, you pull up your camera and you hold that over that, that, that'll pull up a link there, or the link is just simply foothills.cc slash serve. Foothills.cc slash serve. It's a real simple form. Our staff will follow up and help you figure out next steps. Guys, next week we will be concluding our series spinoff. I absolutely love this series because it helps me to look at the Bible from different angles and see characters and lessons that I would have not otherwise uh, found. I hope it's been encouraging you in your walk with Jesus. Have a fantastic Sunday. We'll see you next week.